Okay, welcome to video two. Um, sorry about some of the camera work in the first video. Uh, the GoPro, it's a little hard to judge the actual camera angle. This next video is going to be approximately 15 minutes long and it will show the actual distillation so you can record the appropriate observations and a brief wrap up of uh, the experiment in general. At this point, it's been five minutes. Uh, the distillation hasn't started. We've gently started to warm the flask. And if you look closely, I'll lift up the sash. There is some condensation vapor starting to build around here. So that tells us that things are starting to happen. I don't know if you can see, there's very, very small bubbles here present. Safety alarm, the sash was up too high. So, um, at this point, the reaction has been warmed. It's not boiling five minutes at an elevated temperature, not actively refluxing yet. At this point, I'm gonna increase the heat to 90, as well as I'm going to secure this area, or wrap this area with a bit of tin foil. That tin foil is effectively just a blanket. It's gonna keep the warmth in, and it's going to help us, help this uh, system heat up or stay warmer, and then hopefully collect some of the condensate. Okay, so we're five minutes in. I'm just going to wrap some of this with a bit of tin foil. Again, keeping the heat in to try to encourage condensation, All right? Now, you can see maybe better now that we are starting to get some condensation here. Maybe no active bubbling yet. So the temperature isn't quite hot enough to cause reflux, but we are getting some some refluxing. Now we're going to hide the flask here, all right, uh, with the tin foil. But I'm just going to point out to you now that there is slight discoloration happening. There are some side reactions in this lab. Alkenes form, alkenes will polymerize with acid, and they'll form darkly colored compounds. We fully expect, especially from experience, that this will get darker and darker and darker. However, we do still expect uh, a fair amount of product to be formed. The moment it's formed, it will distill over and we'll collect it there. However, side reactions are, are absolutely expected in this lab. And we'll take indication of that by a strong discoloration. More on that later. Right? Maybe if I'm clever, we can keep a little window of see what's happening. Again, ordinarily, I would wrap this entire vessel with tin foil, but for observation of the temperature and watching vapor collect on the bottom of the thermometer, I'm only going to do part of that, all right? Time travel. Okay, we're 12 minutes in now. So, five minutes warming, an additional seven minutes of heating, and we have active boiling. The coloration, I don't know if that's coming through, but it is absolutely boiling. We have condensing all the way up the distillation head, and we are starting to see some small amount of condensation inside the condenser. We haven't collected, oh, my apologies, we have just started to collect material in the receiving flask. That's been about, I guess at this point, 13 minutes. temperature at distillation is, as far as I can see, 95 and a half, 96 degrees Celsius. Discoloration, all right, we've got a light peach color happening here, vigorous boiling, and active collecting of material in the receiving flask. Thankfully, we can't smell this, or I can't smell this. I know this stuff smells very, very bad, um, but, uh, Keeping things in the fume hood has really worked for us. Right. Reflux is continuing. The tinfoil seems to have done a very good job of keeping the heat in, so that happened very quickly. Um, boiling is vigorous, but not out of control. So just to encourage the reaction, I am not going to lower the heat on the variable transformer. I'm gonna keep it where it is. And you can see the boiling chips. I'm not sure if you can see it with the camera. I can see it. The bubbles are forming very nicely on the boiling chips, which is encouraging smooth, vigorous boiling and not bumping. Without boiling chips, materials, we say bump, and that means 
very large bubbles form and this whole thing tends to almost erupt. Uh, here with the boiling chips, large surface area, we get very smooth boiling and very nice condensation of material. Uh, it's hard to estimate exactly how much material we've collected at this point, but we're getting drops of material probably about once every couple seconds. Yeah, every two or three seconds. It's going quite well. So I'm going to keep a close eye on this. When it looks like the material is not completely distilled over, but mostly distilled over, I'm going to stop the heating, drop the heat source, and then let the glassware cool. Okay, we're at about the 21 minute mark, 22 minute mark, and I'll pull this back a little bit. Got a bit of an orange color happening. The volume is really quite small, and more importantly, what we see is the temperature is starting to drop on the distillation. Right now, we're at about 86 degrees. It's not that the solution is cool by any means, it just means that vapor is no longer being driven over because we've driven over most of the product. And what we have happening in the bottom of the reaction vessel is polymerization and heavier, heavier, less volatile compounds being formed. And what's happening is we just simply don't have sufficient vapor coming up, condensing, and keeping the thermometer hot. So this is a very good indication that the condensation, or the uh, evaporation, or the distillation has decreased or started to slow down. So uh, I have turned off the variable transformer and I am dropping the heat source away and maybe you can see that orange color that I'm talking about. Uh, temperature is continuing to drop, it's apparently about 82 degrees, 83 degrees, and we're going to consider this reaction done. Um, I believe most of the material, if not all of the cyclohexenes have been distilled over. What remains is a polymerized version of the various alkenes. All right. Uh, this is quite warm. I'm going to leave it sit. Uh, because we do still have some vapors present, I'm going to let this cool for a little bit longer away from the heat source uh, before I turn off the condensing hose. All right, we've let the system cool for approximately five minutes. I've removed the heat source. The flask is very comfortable to touch. Well, it's warm. It's not hot by any stretch. Uh, I'm going to disassemble the glassware. Now, keep in mind, this stuff should be kept in the fume hood. It's going to be covered with um, the vapor of the product. And as such, anybody that's smelt uh, alkenes before are very aware of how badly it smells. Those that have ever done fiberglassing, that's exactly what it smells like. And so what I'm going to do is, as I disassemble the glassware, I'm going to rinse it into a container. So I've got organic waste. Uh, it's primarily acetone in there now um, be, from other rinses. Um, this would not be washed in the sink. The smell is too strong. Water insoluble. These are alkenes, very hydrophobic. Um, water won't really do much for us. However, using a small amount of acetone, uh, this should become, it should get nice and clean. All right, so dis disassembling. Small amounts of acetone, a waste container. And again, when we rinse glassware with acetone, we're using an organic solvent to clean things. We want to use a minimum amount, so small rinses, way more effective than great big single rinses. All right, I'm going to turn off the water for the condenser and disassemble. And again, please keep in mind that this stuff is fragile and it will break if you drop it. All right, disassembling. Sorry if the camera works a little dodgy. I just want to show you that, yes, absolutely, we can use organic solvents to clean glassware. But again, keeping in mind that this is also now more organic waste, we really want to keep this to a minimum, right? All right, so I'll continue that later. You don't need to watch this, all right? So we'll move to our reaction vessel. I'll clean that up a little bit later, but effectively it's the same procedure. You can see that our product has been formed. It's murky. This is likely because of a small amount of moisture or water. That is a byproduct of this reaction. Uh, water will steam distill over with our products. So 
that would, I'm guessing, probably three or three and a half mils of our cyclo, uh, cyclohexenes and cyclopentene perhaps, uh, and some water. And that's the, causing the murkiness. All right. So I have a clean test tube and I will transfer the liquid using the pipette. And again, maybe now you can see the murkiness that's present. Again, yield is not important in this lab. What we are looking for is the ratio of the various products. Uh, using the GC mass spec, we'll be able to identify relative amounts as well as the identity of the molecules using the search library. So hopefully we'll see three, four, maybe even five different products. Five, 40 minutes of experiment we have murky material this will undergo GC mass spec analysis in the Kelowna lab uh, of which this material is fairly volatile it's going to be a little smelly and um, we will supply each student with a copy of the mass spec of this reaction vessel to be incorporated into their report a couple points of clarification um, first of all uh, make sure in your reports you make mention of some of the small changes that we did in the experiment outside the experimental. Uh, one would have been we used a thermal well. Uh, that's new to most everyone. I would encourage you to include a diagram of the setup. Anytime you use an elaborate setup of glassware that you haven't seen before, it's always a good idea to include a diagram, including the thermal well indication. Um, one of the things that I should mention uh, our material is murky. I think we, sh we showed that in the earlier uh, picture. And that is because water distilled over with it. The experimental, as written in the lab manual, suggests that uh, it be worked up with brine to remove some of the water, and followed by a treatment of the organic layer with uh, a drying agent. That's not required in this lab. This material is quite volatile. Uh, the cyclohexenes uh, and the pentenes uh, are volatile and if you could smell it you would appreciate how volatile they are. When they go to the GC mass spec we'll actually be analyzing the vapor above the solution. That's representative of the solution intact and because our GC mass spec is very sensitive we require very very little material. As a result the solution won't be analyzed but rather it's the vapor over top of the solution. So it's not required that we remove the water using brine and a drying agent. Uh, we are simply going to be analyzing the vapor. So the workup, as described in the manual, is not going to be completed. In fact, it's made quite a bit easier by analyzing what is referred to as the headspace. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that's the end of the lab. At this point, I would ask that you reconvene in your collaborate session with your instructor to answer or ask uh, any questions you may have regarding the lab and the lab write-up itself.